Hello, my name's Hope Frost and on behalf of SBK Healthcare, I'm delighted to welcome you to this Flash Glucose Monitoring Patient Experience video. We do hope that you find it useful and enjoy it. Please share your thoughts in the comment section and make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any new content that we upload. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Hope Frost and on behalf of SBK Healthcare I'm delighted to welcome you to this Flash Glucose Monitoring Patient Experience webinar. I'd like to thank Abbott for sponsoring this webinar. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Ramsey Ajan from the University of Leeds who will be chairing this webinar. Hi Ramsey. Hi Frost, thank you very much. Uh, hello everyone. So my name is Ramzi Ajjan, I'm a professor of metabolic medicine in Leeds um, and I'll be chairing this session today as, as, as Hope said. Um, now one thing is that I deal with patients with diabetes and I do research in diabetes as well trying to improve the care of, of these individuals. And if you want to be a good healthcare professional in diabetes, of course, you need to know a lot. You need to know the guidelines and you need to know the latest in the fields. But that makes you good. To be excellent, you need to know how to deal with the patients because each patient has got different needs. I think that is very important. I learned that through, you know, I've got a few gray hairs and I, I learned that through life. It's so important that you adjust your management according to the need of each patient. And that brings me to present um, um, our um, uh, speaker today. Elise Quarrington is an athlete and not any athlete, right? So, so Elise has competed in the triathlons for the past six years. And, you know, I, I contribute to the triathlons, but I usually just sit and watch it from the sofa. That's my contribution. But Elise has been sort of doing it, which is, as you can imagine, quite hard. And Elise is a, is a videographer and has been living with diabetes for four years. So she's going to tell us how is it to live with diabetes and be able to have a career in videography as well as have this sort of contribute to the, or compete, not contribute, it's me who contributes, compete in the triathlons. So the floor is yours, Elise. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me all right. Just wanted to start by saying thank you for um, coming to listen to me talk about me. Um, it's so nice to know that, you know, there's a lot of people interested in hearing about uh, type 1's experiences and um, learning how everybody copes differently with having type 1. So I'm just going to share my screen and talk you through my life. So, as Ramsey said, um, my name's Elise. I am a type 1 diabetic um, and I have been a triathlete for the last six years. So I've tried to put as minimal words on this and as many pictures as possible so I don't bore you all. Um, so I live in Winchester with my partner and our puppy. Um, I have a sports science degree. My background's kind of been sport, sport, sport. Um, and I graduated there uh, from Birmingham about six or four or five years ago now. Um, and I have a videography business. So I film weddings, events, businesses, anything going really. Um, I've been a sports model for the last few years, um, just doing kind of freelance work. And I, like I said, I have a black German Shepherd puppy who is the love of my life also the source of all of my troubles and problems. <laughs> um, uh, one of my greatest achievements has been that my brother and I swam the length of the channel five times in five days. Uh, we tried, well, we thought about swimming the actual channel itself, but it's very expensive to kind of get the boat to come with a safety boat to come with you. So that would have been all of our um, charity money that we raised gone. So we thought, well, let's just make it a challenge and do it five times in five days around various lakes and pools. Um, I am a very keen traveller. My brother lives in Vietnam, so I get to see him quite a lot. And I love scuba diving. Um, and I have a brother and a sister, and my parents live in Ascot. Um, my family are amazing, and I think my poor mum, every child that leaves the house, she either gets 
another dog or a foster child to kind of refill a bit of an empty nest syndrome. Um, so I was diagnosed when I was 24 years old, so that was kind of three and a half years ago now. Um, I found out that I was diagnosed, it, to be honest, it took months. I didn't, I didn't obviously know overnight and there's no family link for me, whereas a lot of type ones kind of have a, have a link, um, either their parents or grandparents and nobody as far as we've traced back in my family has it. Um, so I, well, I got extremely thirsty for probably a couple of months. It was just getting worse and worse. And it was just this in-depth kind of need for water. It wasn't just, I needed to have a drink. I was, I needed something to drink all the time. Um, I lost loads of weight. I think my BMI dropped to about 15 and I lost about eight kilos. Um, I lost my sight kind of quite quickly, probably over the space of a week and everything just went very blurry, very fast. Uh, so I ended up with glasses for a little bit. I went to the opticians and um, nothing was really picked up. It just, I just got glasses and it made it better for a couple of days and then everything got blurry again. Um, and then I, well, I kind of ignored all the symptoms um, for a couple of months. And then I woke up one night at probably 2 a.m. and drank about three pint glasses of water. And that's when I kind of started thinking, okay, something's not really right. And I thought maybe I've got a thyroid problem because they all, they present with quite similar symptoms to diabetes. Um, and then I woke up in the morning and I spoke to my mum and dad and we kind of all laughed and thought, no, it definitely won't be anything like that. And I ignored it again for another couple of weeks. <laughs> so I then eventually did go to the doctors because I just felt terrible. Um, they, I said, I think I have a thyroid problem and gave all of my symptoms and she said, okay, well, we'll take your blood sugar as well and it will come back in, in a day or two and we'll let you know. Um, they called me an hour later and said, your blood sugar's 32, you need to go to the hospital. Um, and I'm sure you're all aware, but my blood sugar should be between kind of four and eight as an average person. Um, and my HbA1c was over 130, so I don't think I was very well at the time. Um, I, yeah, so I went to the hospital um, funnily enough, it was, of the, it was the day of one of my best friend's weddings. So I was in full wedding attire, went to the hospital, <laughs> um, very dressed up for appointments. And um, they started me on insulin. And then that was kind of, that's been my life for the last three and a half years. So my first year of diagnosis was a total roller coaster, obviously. I mean, any diabetic will understand that. Um, you know, your mental health kind of took a bit of a hit, but not, you know, it's not all negative. I think this is, I go on to talk about my, uh, what I've found the benefits and the challenges of diabetes has been, and it's definitely mentally strengthened me. Um, but yeah, I think having the diagnosis of um, diabetes and kind of feeling like my life is now going to be ruled by this thing, um was pretty tough to kind of accept i guess uh i think it only now kind of three only in the last six months to a year have i really felt like okay i've got more of a grip on this and kind of accepted that this is me for life now um i remember my first hypo i felt was when i i went for dog walk and i was driving home and I just felt terrible. And obviously I didn't really know what it was at that point and all the usual hypo symptoms and checked my blood sugar and it was still in double figures at 10. And that was kind of my first hypo because and my blood sugar was so used to running in the 20s and 30s that anything below that made me feel terrible. Um, and yeah, learning how to inject myself was probably, probably the biggest challenge. I think my... Um, I have, well, I had the biggest fear of needles. I was, I passed out in the shop window of Claire's getting my ears pierced when I was 19. Um, I, I hated needles. So overcoming that was a big challenge. And my parents had to do my injections for a good few months. And my sister was uh, studying to be a doctor. So she um, used the opportunity, should we say, to learn how to do injections. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, my parents and the support system that I had at the time, obviously my friends and family were amazing. They were my rocks and they got me through that first year. And I can't um, emphasize enough how difficult it must be for parents of type ones, especially of young type ones for kids or teenagers who go through this diagnosis. And they had to check on me for the first 
couple of months of my life every every night at two or three a.m. they'd come in to make sure that I was still you know alive and breathing that I hadn't put myself into a coma from learning how to do insulin and obviously like now my routine's a lot more stable and I know what to inject but at the time when you're starting you don't know how your body's going to react to suddenly st starting injecting insulin so they start you on a super super small dose um and I so I was started on kind of when I went to the hospital and they told me, okay, this is, they showed me how to inject myself and they showed me what insulin was, et cetera. Um, and they said that, you know, you need to start injecting at breakfast, lunch and dinner, and then you have your long acting in the evening. And so I thought, um, you know, coming from no knowledge about diabetes at all, I thought, okay, I'm only allowed to inject this three times a day. And then once in the evening, I didn't have a clue what um, correction doses were. So, I remember, I think it's probably for the first four or five months, um, all I would do was inject at breakfast, lunch and dinner. And then it was only when my blood sugar kind of spiked after one meal and stayed really high. And then I called my nurse and I was like, what do I do? Because I, I can't inject before my next meal. So, you know, it's, it's little things like that. Just understanding that going from no knowledge at all to suddenly having to um, deal with, with having type 1 diabetes was... Um, pretty tough so then obviously it's a very very steep learning curve um, from there I am still going through a lot of what they call honeymoon phases um, I I was told you know when I was diagnosed that my body would kind of my pancreas would rally and try and have another go because it kind of gets a rest from you injecting insulin and then wants to have another go um, so I, but I'm still going through it three and a half years later and I only find out that my pancreas is kind of having a go through hypos. So I'm a lot more kind of able to deal with it now because I can tailor my insulin a lot quicker and I know what I'm doing a lot more with it. Um, but yeah, that first year was um, tough of a lot of hypos. <laughs> um, and then obviously I learned about my diet and how much it impacts me. And uh, as you can see in that second picture, I still do eat terrible things. <laughs> they are not diabetic friendly brownies. Um, and you know, you still, you still can eat normal things. It's not something that's gonna completely rule my life. Um, I just need to obviously tailor what I eat and every diabetic's different. And I've just found that for me, eating like low, low, low carbs in the evening helps me kind of sleep better at night because I know that I'm not gonna spike or hypo through the night too much. Um, and yeah, so that whole first year was just gradually bringing my BMs down. And um, I remember the first time I hit single figures was time to celebrate. <laughs> so my background, as you know, is all kind of sport, sport, sport. So I rode to a national level when I was younger and then a back injury, I fractured, I got three stress fractures in my lower spine and that kind of took me out of that sport. And then when I went to University of Birmingham, I joined the swimming team. I tried every sport under the world when I was at uni, as you do. Um, and I kind of fell into triathlons through the swim team. Uh, and then I went on to compete at the uh, Europeans. Um, and hopefully when racing starts again, I'll get back to Europeans or Worlds in the next few years. Um, the main kind of difficulties I've found with sport, obviously everybody knows you know, sport's good for you. Um, but, and yes, in the kind of, in the long run of the day, so like a whole, if you take a whole day, it does definitely help manage my blood sugar levels. But during exercise, it has been very difficult learning how to manage my blood sugars because every single different sport has different effects on my blood sugar. And um, the last, three and a half years has been learning what sport does what if that makes sense uh so like for example if i was walking i generally walking makes me hypo a lot um so i think and versus running whereas if i went out for a run i spike and i know that's kind of i mean rams you will correct me if i'm wrong but uh due to kind of the stress response on my body it kind of releases stored glucose so it makes me hype go hyper high when I run um, whereas walking doesn't kind of have enough stress on the body so you just constantly burn that sugar um, and uh, yeah through races I mean I, I think I competed in my first triathlon 
something like six weeks after being diagnosed. So, I, and I think I was advised probably not to, but <laughs> I didn't want to miss the race. Um, and my parents always stand around the course kind of holding out jelly babies ready for me. Um, and I start, I always start the race a little bit high. So kind of in double figures, because I know that as soon as I start the race, I'm going to spike a little bit more, but then as the race goes on, because of the normally a couple hours long, I do start to go down and I'll, I'll always have bits on the bike. And then my parents, like I said, will be around the run course waiting for me to kind of grab jelly babies and run. Um, and yeah, if I'm ever doing kind of late night training sessions, so my swim sessions are kind of nine to 10 in the evening. So if I want to eat dinner after that, normally I'm the most unstable kind of straight after I eat because I know that I'm going to spike and then fall and then, or just stay stable. You know, you don't know how, I don't always know how my body's going to react to what I eat. So if I finish at 10 and then want to eat dinner or have something to eat after session, then getting to sleep kind of takes a good couple of hours. So I have definitely found that a bit of a challenge. Um, so the main kind of challenges that I found with having diabetes, and I'm sure they're kind of similar to most other people's diabetes and pet peeves really. Um, like I've already spoken about mental health, uh, I, I'm generally a very, very positive person, I like to think. But you know, everybody, no matter how positive you are, has their down days and it's been a big um, kind of adaptation, obviously, that I've had to make in my life. Um, and yeah, knowing, especially in kind of in the first year, I felt like the only diabetic in the world. I didn't really know that there were the type ones. I didn't know anybody else with it. Um, I didn't know how to manage it. I hated injections. It was just, it was hard. It was kind of one thing on top of another especially in that first year but then after that you kind of you know I accepted that's this is what it is and you know I there's a lot worse things that life could have handed me and at least we're in an age where you know the the pens the injection pens are so small the needles are small and you can carry them around and you don't have to kind of draw them up out of the vial like they used to have to um and I can check my blood sugar so quickly and with this flash glucose which I'll go on to talk about in a minute um so yeah i the bruising was mainly so my long acting i'm now on leather and that gave me hives all down my legs i looked like i've been attacked by something um and yeah i bruised like a peach um so that's you know not been the most fun but it's fine it's not the worst thing in the world i think my biggest anybody that knows me knows that i hate when people ask me should I be eating that? And I'm sure every diabetic in the world will relate to that question and makes you want to throw people out the window. Um, I think there's, there is a confusion between type one and type two and, and I was guilty that I didn't know at all. I mean, I knew that one was kind of autoimmune and one was more kind of later in life due to diet and lifestyle factors. Um, but I didn't know the difference. And I think people are just, uneducated around it really and if they see me eating something sugary it just kind of comes out and they'll just say oh should you really be eating that um and yes i'm not saying diabetics should be eating five tons of ben and jerry's but i don't think many people in this world should be eating five tons of ben and jerry's um and you know we each know you know your body and i know what how to handle eating something sweet you know everybody's human at the end of the day um i've you know i've been, been through exercise and how I've found that a bit of a challenge. Uh, I think hypos absolutely suck. I don't think anybody likes a hypo, but I'm the queen of hypoing at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, and I kind of wake up and then wonder why I'm awake and then the feeling of a hypo just hits you like a bus and it's horrendous. But um, I think learning kind of what uh, it's best to treat my hypos as well. Everybody's different and most people love jelly babies, but I feel like my teeth are going to be suffering soon. <laughs> um, and my poor partner has had to deal with many multiple emotional changes throughout uh, every day, really. Uh, I've learned that when I go high, I get a little bit grumpy. Um, whereas when I go low, I just get quite emotional. <laughs> um, and I think I, you know, the long-term health is, 
even if no matter how well controlled you are, you're going to have bad days. And I, I have bad days all the time. And I'd like to think I'm reasonably well controlled. Um, so, you know, and you know, if you are a badly controlled diabetic, it can take years off your life. So there's, there's that kind of looming over your head the whole time, just thinking, God, is this literally, you know, is me, is my blood sugar running at 15 going to take two years off my life? You know, you don't, it's, it's quite a scary thought. Um, it's a bit of like the unknown, isn't it? Um, and I've heard that diabetics make an extra 180 decisions a day. And I, yeah, I've been meaning to kind of wake up and try and count that because I think that's definitely a very um, accurate statistic. You know, you have to think about absolutely everything. Um, as soon as I wake up, it's my first thought, oh, what's my blood sugar? Um, anything that I eat, I think, where's my insulin? What's my blood sugar? Uh, after you eat, you know, if you go out the house, I can't just walk out of the house. I have to think, oh, I need my sugar. I need my insulin, I need my reader, um, et cetera. Uh, and uh, forgetting your insulin is the worst thing in the world. And I, I don't mean just missing a dose because that was annoying, but I mean, if I go out for dinner and I literally forget to take my pen, that only happened twice. And one time I drove probably about 45 minutes to go meet friends for dinner and I had forgotten it. And I thought I can either have a salad or I can go back and get my insulin and then go and have a pizza. <laughs> so I definitely drove back to go and get my insulin. Um, yeah, I mean, they're just little pet peeves in day-to-day -day life, isn't it? But um, it's not all doom and gloom. There are lots of, I mean, there are lots of benefits to having diabetes. If some, I thought someone asked me that, that long ago, um, like, do you really resent having it? And I don't at all. It's taught me so much about my body. Um, I've, I now, you know, you're, my other organs are just respecting my other organs so much they're just working without me having to think about it um you know your body's trying so hard to keep you alive and we don't even have to tell it to do anything it's amazing it just the whole science of of diabetes is fascinating um i've learned that there's a huge online community especially through things like instagram which i wasn't aware of until the last year and now my instagram um is my kind of source of meeting other diabetics and connecting with people uh it's how i raise awareness um i think there's you know as a as a diabetic i now have a responsibility to um support other people with it as much as i can and get out there and kind of raise awareness and educate other people um i like kind of beating beating the stereotype as in um the kind of oh you're diabetic you shouldn't be eating that kind of um stereotype I think uh, and I think a lot of people say if they ask me either what the patches on my arm or they see me injecting and kind of that you can see them watching out of their corner of their eye and then you tell them it's okay you can ask me what I'm doing um, I think yeah a lot of people kind of say oh but you, you don't look like you should have diabetes and that's again it's just education around it um, and a lot of people have told me I'm not fat enough to have diabetes or um, I'm not old enough. So, and a, a lot of them haven't, um, not haven't heard of type 1 diabetes. They, you know, they've heard of it, but they don't realize that's something that a lot of people are born with. Um, so yeah, educating and, and raising awareness is, has been a really um, kind of passion of mine, I guess. Um, Oh uh, yeah, um, obviously my dog. Um, so he's at the moment he's six months old. Um, we got him four months ago. He, I'm planning to hypo scent train him. So we've just started, and he has absolutely no idea what he's doing, but he thinks it's really fun. Whatever we're doing. Um, so I think it's going to take a good year or two to properly train him how to do it. And I don't need him to do it because I'm I'm very aware of my hypos. I have good. Um, awareness of them I feel them kind of before I go lower them for uh but it would just be a nice little party trick to be able to have a dog that can smell them <laughs> before I can feel them apparently they're, they're supposed to be able to smell them out kind of 15 20 minutes before I can feel it so it'll be quite an interesting interesting journey um and yeah I put snacks on there because it's not all bad and everybody likes snacks so uh, and overall my my health has improved my diet's improved um and just my general awareness of of my body and um what I'm eating what I'm putting into it directly impacts 
um, your blood sugar straight away. Um, so I got the flash glucose monitor uh, probably about two years ago now. So I finger pricked for a year and a half and I don't know how people do it for all their life because my fingers went numb and calloused and it was, you know, it was um, painful. Um, whereas this is just so quick and it's a lot less um, medical looking and that you're not kind of getting your finger prick around. I used to get blood everywhere. It was some horror movie scenes. Um, it's so it's it's instant. It's a lot less invasive. Um, obviously, I you still like I still prick my fingers. Probably I should probably do it more often than I do. But um, every day uh, when I go low, just because there's a slight lag in um, in the reading, because it's interstitial reading, it's not actually reading the blood. Whereas your finger prick's going to read your blood sugar. Um, and yeah, it's it's a talking problem. It's a talking point. Sorry. Um, you know, if people see it. They, oh, they want to ask you what it is. And actually one of my posts on Instagram was about uh, what people have asked me what it is. And you get kind of, is it a nicotine patch quite a lot? Um, <laughs> and one person actually asked me if, if I'd been tagged by the police, which I had a little fun with that answer. Um, and yeah, it just starts up conversations because it's an opportunity to then talk about it. And it's nice when you kind of see somebody else wearing it, even if they're you know, a complete stranger walking down the street, you instantly have a connection with them and you just start talking. And um, it's, yeah, it's um, a nice little talking point. Um, so with regards to exercise and kind of day to day, uh, it's definitely had a positive impact on my mental health. Um, it's been, it's kind of given me targets and I'll go through in a minute kind of what, um, uh, what different settings there are on the reader. Um, but it's, it has given me, um, yeah, things to aim for with regards to my like average glucose per day. Um, and it's, it's what it's taken away one less thing. And, you know, I don't have to finger prick now so much. Um, so it's just slightly easier to manage, which is great. Uh, my HbA1c check then when I go to the doctors isn't such a surprise because I can, it gives me an average, you can go up to the last night so I can see how I'm doing. Uh, it's super easy to apply, I always just, my partner puts it on me or I'll do it um, every two weeks. You just change, change arms and I always put it on the back of my arm, um, which is where it's kind of recommended to put it. But I know some people put it in different places. Uh, there's only a couple of drawbacks to it and that it's, um, although it's very small, I still managed to walk into doors. I don't think I've realized that I'm only <laughs> like two millimeters wider on the outside of my arm. Um, and it's uh, like the reader itself isn't waterproof. So it's obviously taking it swimming has been, I've had to just find some waterproof bags and I just hop out the pool every now and then to check it. Um, but it is super easy to use obviously when I'm, on the bike or running, you can just swipe. I don't have to stop and constantly prick my fingers. Um, that's a lot less things to take. I mean, you can read it on your phone. So that's the reader and that's my phone. So like with regards to size, I just prefer um, taking my little reader with me, but you know, I do have it on, have the setting on my phone as well. So I can check it. Um, I learned that I'm a serial scanner. I scan every five minutes if I could. Just it gives me peace of mind knowing what I'm what my blood sugar is doing, and it gives you you know it tells you your trend. So if I'm you know if I got a blood finger a uh, blood sugar um, reading saying four point six, I'd be like, oh okay I'm fine. Whereas if on my scan it says four point six but I'm going down, then I know that I need to eat because it would stop me going into a hypo. Uh, so these are kind of examples of some of the screens and on the left here I've just written everything that it gives you and then on the right I've just written what I use and why. So I, I like the, like I said, the average glucose. Um, it reads up to the last 90 days. You can choose the last week or the last 30 days, so the last month or the last 90 days. Um, just so then you know roughly what your HbA1c is going to come out as. Um, it gives you a time and target. So you know, I can see, so that's the fifth picture along. Um, 
I ideally like to kind of stay 70% in target, uh, but I mean, it's not always possible. Um, and that's, that's kind of one of the goals that I set myself is, okay, I need to try and aim to be um, in the blue a bit more. Um, and I've set my target range 4.4 to 8.6. I think I discussed that with my, um, with my uh, diabetic team. And it shows you your daily pattern. So the second picture in from the left is like, it shows me, oh, I, I kind of spike in the night and then I hypo, you know, it gives you kind of trends of, um, and maybe that kind of then would impact my diet and saying, okay, I clearly eat something um, sugary in the middle of the day because I have a bit of a spike. So maybe I need to look at what I'm eating then. Um, and it, uh, yeah, it gives you your like sense of usage. So it tells you how often you scan. And I'm very well aware that I am a serial scanner. So I'm, you know, everyone's aware of this COVID-19 and it's been, yeah, obviously for everybody, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. Um, and especially when the statistics came out about sort of type one diabetics are three times more likely to die if you get COVID and uh, yeah, I think every obviously every person's different every diabetic's different well I know when I get a cold or when I get a stomach bug I my blood sugars go all over the shop I'm quite uncontrollable and you, you know I know that I still have to inject even if you are real so I think it's more the fear around the impact on my diabetes not actually obviously I don't want to get COVID but it's the impact on my diabetes was the biggest um fear for me but you know with diabetes nothing's risk-free it's just you know COVID's now an extra factor that we have to think about um it was rubbish obviously for everybody not being able to see family friends and especially you know when they're they were they're my support system um but I have had time to invest in training that um puppy with the radar ears that you can see there um so with regards to my diabetes appointments obviously they were cancelled and i haven't seen my team for probably about a almost a year now um but there's with the freestyle the um flash glucose thing there's libra view so i can plug it into my computer um and it uploads all of my data so that my um team can see it um and yeah my team kind of talked to me about they sent out emails to every every diabetic about uh, the difference in your insulin requirements if you do become ill and still having to inject. Um, so the most important thing in any diabetic's life is their support system in my eyes. So, I mean, my partner's gone through it all with me. He's definitely problem half problem shared is a problem halved or whatever the saying is uh and then my my parents and my brother and my sister and that the third photo along is at my brother's wedding um and yeah just i think knowing that there are other diabetics out there and that's through having an online community um has been the biggest uh support the biggest um help really for me um oh sorry i didn't need to do that yet uh yeah so just i think you know if i think for the whole first year i i like everybody probably was in a bit of denial and i was just scared of of having it and now that i've kind of embraced having it and accepted okay this is me for life now then um i want to get on and kind of um get out there and start supporting others uh so that kind of leads me on to what my future plans are and i'm in a position now where you know i've had diabetes for a while and i understand what it's like to go through that diagnosis but i couldn't imagine going through this when i was you know a teenager and there's nothing more than you want um you know you don't want to be you don't want to stand out you don't want to be different you want to kind of blend into the background as much as you can and diabetes doesn't let you do that so i think i'm in a position where i can get out there and support others especially younger the younger generation going through it and showing them that you know you still can live your life you can do sport you can own your own business or you know whatever you want to do um i'd like to say that i have diabetes but diabetes doesn't have me 
Um, so yeah, I'm planning to get on and start racing again when when we're allowed to, uh, and just develop my business. And if you want to see what I'm up to, then that's my Instagram, um, The Athletic Diabetic. But yeah, that is everything. So thank you so much for coming to listen to me. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Elise. This was absolutely fantastic. It was great. So please have the questions coming in um, in the Q&A box and we'll try to answer as many as possible. I quite liked the, your, your last slide when you said, I have diabetes, but diabetes doesn't have me. And mm. actually, I, I do tell my patients is that what we're going to do, we're going to control the diabetes. You controlling the mm. diabetes, diabetes is not controlling you, which is which is uh, more or less uh, the same, isn't it? So I'm, I'm really pleased that you put that up. I mean, the, the, there was a lot of learning points for me. I mean, one of the things that I learned, which actually shocked me that five tubs of Ben and Jerry, not good for you. So I have to modify <laughs> my, uh, my behavior now. Right, um, there is, there's a lot of very, very good questions coming in. So let's, let's get on with it. So one question I really liked, it says that, did you feel that you had enough support from the healthcare professional to help with the diabetes emotionally? So forget the numbers and the glucose and so on, but emotionally. Happy. Yeah, I've been asked that a few times, actually. I think, and I, I feel kind of mean saying it because I, my diabetes, but diabetic team are great. And especially at the point of diagnosis, they were amazing. And the, the, I went through the system so fast, you know, within an hour, of going to the GPs, I was into hospital, they'd started me on insulin, it was very much like, you know, this is what we've got to do, very bam, 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 so that was great, but I, other than kind of going in to the beginning of the appointment, and then they ask, oh, how are you doing? I've, I don't think I've ever once been specifically asked how my, kind of how am I actually doing, if that makes sense, how am I, how I'm coping with it, um, it's very much which, you know, is, is, is equally just as important. How are you actually physically handling it? And is how are your blood sugars and everything? It's very important, obviously, but there's a huge mental aspect. Um, so, so if I just press you a little bit on this, because yeah. this, is a, this is an area that is close to my heart as well, is how do you think the healthcare professional best approach this, 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 sort of this area? It's so hard. I mean... I, I've because I've thought about it a lot and I thought well how am I going to get out there and start supporting the younger generation who aren't probably aren't going to open up to their GP about it necessarily um and I think uh COVID aside um you know having some sort of uh, like um like diabetic meetup kind of thing or just the best thing that's helped me is knowing that there's other diabetics out there and talking to them and just saying like even if you just say uh, I had a terrible night like they'll understand it you know nobody understands it like another diabetic does um so I mean obviously I think it needs to be addressed in the sense that it, it needs to be asked more and we need to like um medical professionals need to be asking more direct questions because if you're not if you're not going to ask it then it's never going to be brought up in in a appointment and, 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 and yeah, one thing i always feel passionate about is that continuity of care is important so you get used yeah, to a particular definitely. team so you yeah. can start discussing yeah. these issues yeah now, definitely. you you did mention challenges and did you think there were different challenges post-diagnosis compared to one year after two year after how, how oh how yeah definitely that? yeah and obviously like I said mental health at the beginning but it's mental health all the way through it's you know I'm a lot more controlled and a lot more understanding of it now but with that comes more mental health kind of challenges because you understand it more and you understand god this is so serious if I don't look after myself um so yeah there's definitely been obviously the first load of challenges was getting over injecting myself I think injecting other people is is different but injecting yourself is it's a very strange thing to have to get over like literally self-inflicting that pain that feeling um so that's like a very different challenge now to what I face of um kind of now I'm back to trying to compete to at sport which is a big old challenge um and like different, like I said, different aspects of mental health uh, is definitely. 
So, so um, a question came in that, have you been offered structured education like Daphne course? I'm and actually going on it in two weeks time, the Daphne course. So yeah, <laughs> I'll yeah, let you know. Have yet? No, I'm going on it in two weeks. <laughs> so so you, can't, you, you can't answer the second bit of the question. Sorry. So you've been offered it, but we, we, we can't talk about your experience <laughs> with that. That's, that's, that's absolutely fine. And now one thing that, uh, an early question that came in is about Ballas Advisor that you haven't mentioned anything about it. Do you use a Ballas Advisor? Um, what, or, no, what, what do you mean? In, in terms of, you know, how much, what sort of bolus you need to give if you have a particular... No, no. Yeah. So I did have a meeting with a dietitian, um, but because I'm going through so many honeymoon phases and they kind of said I'm going through more than they expected, uh, it's difficult to carb count at the moment because what I do one month is very different to what I do the next month. Mm -hmm. Um you know, we've split my long acting. So I'm now on morning and night long acting, which has definitely given me more control um, because I inject a lot more in the morning than I do at night now because I go low overnight, whereas in the day I run, I tend to run higher. Um, so in that sense, yes. And I have obviously talked through with dietitians um, and hopefully the Daphne course will be uh, open up another few doors like that. But no, because of the honeymoon phases, it's been... A bit up and down we're just trying to wait till my pancreas finally gives up the ghost which i'm really pressing it to do <laughs> it, it can take it can take a little bit longer which which is a good thing of course now mm -hmm. um, one question that came in is about you know you mentioned the the libri and how useful this has been mm. um, is have you had training on this how did you start and what how do you think you could no, have been done I mean, better i didn't because well, I mean, I think I heard of it probably how other people did through Theresa May when she kind of came out wearing one. And then I self-funded it for a year. So I don't know if it's different now for people that, uh, because it's on the NHS now, if you join through the NHS, if you get some sort of um, guided system through, if that makes sense. Whereas I was very much, I, I think I knew somebody else with it. Um, who gave me a few kind of pointers and I read up a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a, there's a Facebook page and, and things. So I, I just did some, a lot of self research about it mm -hmm. and it's, you know, again, everybody's different. So I, I've learned um, my body reacts to certain things differently to other people's. Um, but no, I think, yeah, because I self funded for a year, I probably, um, I mean, my, like my diabetic consultant, briefly kind of taught me through it I guess mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um but then kind of being on now on the NHS I think hopefully there's a bit more education more, around it. more education no, yeah. no um, absolutely I think I think that's that's quite important because it's a fantastic device but to get the most out of it you need to know how to use it yeah. and yeah. And, and, yeah, you know, I, I do it with my patients sort of a stepwise approach because you don't want to overwhelm people with a lot of mm. things. At one go. Mm. Now, one question that is coming, uh, coming in quite a bit. I mean, you clearly technology helped you with, with the Libre. Have you considered a pump or would you yeah. consider a pump in the future? Definitely. Yeah. And I think I was very anti it for the first couple of years. I think I like, and I still do like a part of kind of, not having too much attached to me so you can't really tell that I've got it I guess a part of me was like that for the first few years whilst I was still kind of learning to accept that I had this but um now that you know I've been injecting for quite a while my parts of my skin's quite sore and I think just general it would help with general controlling it so I definitely like going on the Daphne course is the first step to me being able to um, like go to pump education courses and um, and now obviously you know they've got um, I can't remember what it's called one without wires that doesn't look so medical and um, you know in five ten years who knows what there's going to be as well you know we're in a lucky position where technology is developing fast and mm. yeah but yes I definitely will consider the pump. At least I just found out in the in the chat a section that there are some really good questions as well and there's this question that i love but be careful how you answer it okay. it's, it's, it's a tricky <laughs> one so when you have your clinic appointment right yeah. 
what is the most important thing that you want to discuss? Is that the A1C? So that's one part of the question. The second part is that who do you find the most useful to talk to? Is it the nurse? Is it the doctor? Is it the dietitian? Or do you think an MDT, MDT team is important? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think I, I, it's probably, it's different for everybody, but I get on really well with my consultant. Um, I like her a lot. I think she's very knowledgeable as well. Um, I think, I guess, yeah, the HbA1c is the most important, but it also kind of, like my last one came back and it was only kind of five or six points higher than the one before, but I, because of the way that I think she delivered that it was a little bit higher. Um, it wasn't high by any means, but I then had a bit of an emotional breakdown afterwards. So I think it's just, um, it's, it's so hard because it, the HBMC obviously is so important, but that doesn't, it's not like I'm not trying day to day. So if I get a bad HBMC, it's not going to, I'm not going to be able to try any harder, if that makes sense to mm -hmm. control like I'm you know I think a lot a lot of us are, you, we're doing the best that we can kind of feeling um, I mean, you, you, you mentioned in your talk time in range do yeah. you think that that would be sort of a, an easier one because you can see an immediate yeah. effect if you change yeah them. yeah definitely and then when um like if I look at my averages and if they're either like I once got them all below seven for like 30 days or something which is the best and that was so positive to see and I think because you can see it every day whereas you HBO and see you I don't go I you know I go six months without seeing my healthcare professional and then you suddenly get this bam this is your HBO and Z it's like oh gosh that's out of the blue and it's not as what I thought it was going to be like kind of whereas the time and target gives you a bit more um yeah control I guess like day-to-day -day control if that makes sense Absolutely. Now, in the MDT team, so each person's got a role, but do you think the MDT teams should have a psychologist as well? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Because that, that is something that is coming up quite a bit, actually, in the, in the questions. Yeah. And I know it's like obviously probably down to funding and not having the resources, but that would, a designated person who is literally just there to talk about nothing to do with this, the um, medical aspect of diabetes, just how are you kind of questions. <laughs> So, so I can I can I can tell actually the audience and and you as well that in Leeds I really fought to have a psychologist on our team. Mm. It made a huge difference, absolutely yeah. massive difference yeah. uh, to, the, to the to the whole experience. Okay. So we do have now a psychologist on the NDT team, and I think it, I mean okay. it's, it's, it's been absolutely fantastic. Can I join your right. team? <laughs> so um, let me just say. Um, Right now, there is um, there's a question from a psychotherapist, right, mm -hmm. and it feels that it is difficult sometimes to keep people engaged, right? Mm -hmm. So, any tips? What can be done to keep people like, engaged? Been engaged in their like looking after their diabetic health or looking engaged. Yeah. In so, so, if you think about it, Elisa, I always tell my patients this: that you know, we work in a partnership. It's a team, but it's a very unfair partnership because ninety nine point nine percent of the work is done by the mm. patient, and then I do zero point one percent. Yeah. So, so, how how can we engage people? Because it's it's hard work, no question about it's that. It's so hard, and I think again, like that's where like an online community or having some sort of diabetic community will help because going to your appointments it's very much like this is um you see them once every six months kind of thing and then i feel like you're kind of not that you're forgotten about but you are like another diabetic patient if that makes sense whereas this online community it's like people that go through it every day so i think having some sort of even if you can just direct people to um like specific accounts of people who are showing that you can live with diabetes really easily or um it's having people to talk to um that i think it's hard to get the like, right words with this but do, do you mean peer support yeah that... yeah yeah definitely or maybe having some sort of like um like joint um not obviously 
um, like when you go and see your consultant, kind of having somebody else there as well, another diabetic there, but having some sort of um, evening where you could show as healthcare professionals that you really care about mm -hmm. how diabetics are doing and, that, and about like letting people know that they're not alone because, and it's great, like my diabetic team are great, but they, I know they don't have diabetes kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, and there's no, obviously there's no way of changing that. I don't wish them to have diabetes. I just want them to kind of understand, um, understand it from my point of view, I guess. Um, more things like this, you know, it's great that you're engaging with like wanting to hear diabetics experiences that's it's so great and you know like i said back in the presentation about my nurse told me i could do three injections a day and i didn't realize i could do any more until mm. months down the line and i think if by talking to other diabetics that's how yeah so i mean yeah with regards to engagement just um just showing that it's it's really something you care about like mental health I, I think to be honest with you, you, you summarized it is to show that you care about yeah. the, the individual. So you're not and just I think a exactly. It's not that, you know, it's all about targets and A1C needs to come to this number and this has mm -hmm. happened. It's just a, 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 a sort of a, an approach that you care about the person. So if yeah. I just follow on from that, let's say you've got some difficulty, the HP1C has gone to 90. Mm. for instance and it was fine before it was running between sort of 50 and 60 it wasn't too bad it mm. was pretty good actually and it's gone to 90 for whatever reason what would be the most useful thing the team can do for you in your views i guess well i mean and they would do like you would explore why it's gone to 90 you know it might not just it might be something some um might be something completely undiabetic related that's happened um and because stress makes my blood sugar run high, for sure. Stress makes me go up. So I think following up, even if it's over email or having um, like a phone number that you can text, like just someone to follow up with you, that continuity, like you said, of, okay, let's make a plan. Let's, um, let's do some sort of food diary or whatever, or explore why it's gone up and then following up in a week, just call that person or, and I know again, it's resources and it might not be that doable. Um, but just have some sort of, it has obviously it's setting a plan and being like, okay. I tell you what, that's, that's music to my ears because that's what we, we try to do is frequent follow-ups, yeah. uh, even a phone call, not necessarily a face to face, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. you know, people, people need support. Again, now, there's a question, care, isn't it? <laughs> now there's a question that came in that mm -hmm. is great. And I think you'll love it, but we really need to know your views on this. So okay. somebody's involved in a project for teenagers to buddy with a patient. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, you know, so, so you can have that support during the transition. What do you think of that approach? Yeah, I, I think that's, that is amazing. That is definitely what I have thought about um, trying to start up in my area because of, you know, the hospital care that I'm under just, I mean, it's very, it sounds very different to what you're providing. Um, I think that would be amazing because especially teenagers aren't going to be, oh, I need, they're not going to say, I'm going to call my GP because I feel a bit rubbish about my blood sugars this week. You know, I, I already support a few younger people that, you know, I know they're either friends of someone or whatever, they're with diabetes and they're teenagers. Um, and, you know, I've been on a dog walk with a few of them or just being that kind of someone to listen to who has it, who's, you know, and I'm, I'm reasonably young myself in my diagnosis. And um, I think, yeah, buddying system would be incredible for teenagers. And I don't know necessarily about children, but I think support for their parents would be. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I think... Personally, I think it's a great idea, but of course we need to have the feedback from, from people. So um, mm. maybe I should nick that idea and start a project in Leeds yeah. as well, or collaborate with, with, with the person. So, so one thing that you said is that walking causes you hypos mm. and then running hyper. And yeah. you do different things with the triathlons that you know, I watch from the sofa and never contribute. Yeah. And mm. so how did you adjust to that? Did you have 
um, did you have sort of proper education that different sports do different things or is that something uh, that, that trial and error? Trial and error and Dr. Google has been, <laughs> um, right. I mean, and I like trial and big errors sometimes, I think, you know, and not that long ago, probably a month ago, I hypoed so badly on a walk, my partner had to like run across a field carrying a bag of jelly babies because I was on the edge of passing out, I think. Um, walking just, and I, I don't know if it happens to every diabetic, but walking makes me hypo. Um, whereas running makes me spike and different times of the day makes me do different things as well if I get up and train straight away I find I'll go high a lot quicker than if I had eaten breakfast chilled out for a bit and then went for a run so it's very much a trial and error and I feel like everybody's probably a bit different with that and um, do you think it would be helpful to have sort of sport clinics um, yeah, sort of for people yeah. with diabetes because that's you know it's 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 that's a right. science and uh, well, like a combination of science and art, I, I, I say usually. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and you know, like I said, the overall effect of sport, everybody knows it's good for you. But if I was a diabetic that wasn't sporty and I went to go and do a training session and my blood sugar shot up, you'd be like, well, why am I doing this? It's clearly making my blood sugar go crazy. You know, I think a bit of education around it would go a long way. Okay, so uh, another question just came in is about, you, you mentioned that you haven't been seen for a year. So have well, you been... I've had phone calls, um, but because of COVID. Um, yeah, and... but, but have you been offered a telephone or a video consultation? Yeah, yeah. So I had, um, uh, the beginning of the first lockdown, I had a phone call with my consultant. Um, and I plugged in my reader thing and it went on to leave review and she was able to see uh, my um, readings. Um, but it's very... Uh, the bad thing is it's very easy to fall through the net if you don't care that much. Like mm. I really care about my health and I know how dangerous this is. So I have made the effort then to, like, you're left to kind of book your own appointments. And I thought I'd booked one in for November, but I, I, I think it I had gotten missed or something. So I actually don't have one in for a little while yet. Um, so, you know, and if I didn't chase that or follow that up, I don't know how quickly the team would unfortunately um mm -hmm. so i think it is quite easy to fall through the net if you're someone who wouldn't um doesn't respond well to so just flying on from that um you know the covid opened up all these possibilities of video consultation telephone consultation <laughs> would you be would you feel comfortable with video consultation replacing face to face altogether or do you think the face to face is still very important I think it, yeah, it is important for it. If I had a psychologist, then yes, it would be very important. And I would want to see them face to face because it, there's something, you know, it's harder to open up to someone over, over Zoom. Um, but no, I mean, for my, like my generic appointments, I would be quite happy doing them over Zoom um, or phone call or, you know. Always over Zoom or. Intermittently. I think it's probably a well. I mean, they've got to suppose you know they they've got to check your feet and they they do they check your injection sites and stuff, which I think is quite important because I'm definitely one diabetic that gets comfortable with injection sites. So I'm I'm currently going through my stomach site, and I know when my healthcare team sees me, they'll tell me to change the site. But because I haven't seen them yet, so I just keep going with my stomach. And um, so I think yeah, that is a very important element to seeing people face to face um but you know and uh, we're making do in covid and that's you know we we all yeah we're i'm talking about post covid so i yeah. think yeah i think it it is time uh, at least this this has been absolutely fascinating so thank, thank you very you. much i think um i enjoyed it tremendously and i think others uh, as well so thank yeah. you very much for that and i'm going to hand back to hope uh, to wrap things up for us Thank you, Ramsey, and thank you so much, Elise. That's been amazing. We've got lots of thanks coming through in the chat box, and people have really appreciated it. So, thank you for you know, sharing your time. I'd like to thank Abbott for sponsoring this webinar again. And finally, I'd just like to thank um, Elise and Ramsey for such an interesting hour. It's been brilliant. I hope you've enjoyed it, and goodbye. Thank you.